All right, everyone, as though all of human history isn't enough to prove the point, let's just look at fairly recent human history with regards to the eh, last half decade or so, the struggle against censorship, specifically on the internet with larger internet firms. I posit this. I think that there should be no restrictions on speech that doesn't cross the line into potentially causing some other secondary harm and therefore would be covered under U.S. law. Copyright, defamation, slander, things of that nature, terroristic threats, incitement. With regards to those, it's not the speech itself, or in some cases the expression in a nonverbal sense, that is, that is why it's illegal, it's, it's the secondary effect of it. The violation essentially of other people's NAP. And it's basically the basis of the only proper role of what you could loosely call censorship uh, in any communicative form. It's not really censorship because it's not really the speech that you have a problem with, it's, it's what is caused by it. It's not you yelling fire in the theater, it's the fact that you caused a stampede and a bunch of people had, had injuries because of that. It's the secondary characteristic of the speech itself that's particularly important. I think that the only way that we can combat extremism, which is a problem, there are extremists in the world, sometimes they blow themselves up, sometimes they just blow you up. Uh, the only way to combat that is with absolute, is free speech absolutism. That is, when we allow corporations uh, to begin censoring speech, again, for no legitimate purpose, simply people who have an unpopular or taboo opinion about some social issue. They're, they're not expressing violent tendencies, they're not threatening violence, they're not defaming anyone, they're just explaining their opinion on, on, on feminism or, or masculinity or on racial issues or something. When corporations, which typically don't have great reputations, even among the left, uh, begin delving into these issues. Number one, they're doing it for money. They're not doing it because they're woke in, in the ideological sense. They're doing it to gain more money. Uh, so they're using the situation. In fact, they like it when people are angry at each other because when you get two people to hate one another, you can sell one of them a shirt that says, I hate my enemy. Uh, just as an example here, there are a lot of corporations currently doing this. They deliberately antagonize conservatives or, or what you could loosely call the anti-woke crowd. They do that on purpose to sell you a product and to sell them a product at the same time. It's funny, uh, the same parent firm will have two subjugate companies, one of which caters to the left and one of which caters to the right. And nobody notices this strategy. It's totally about ideology, not about trying to make a buck. The only way to combat actual hateful extremist views is by countering them with other views. The problem with the kind of censorship we currently see, which is absent free speech absolutism, uh, is that you create echo chambers. So what happens right now is that on Gab, for example, um, it is primarily people that are traditionalistic or at the very least, they're, they're not part of the left. Parler is very populistic. It's not an echo chamber, but it's, it's geared towards the Trump sort of populist nativist crowd. If you look at, if you look at uh, um, uh, Odyssey or BitChute or anything like that, there tends to be a slant to the views. Now, it's very funny when people that are part of the lamestream will recognize that, but they don't recognize the echo chamber style of a place like Twitter. Twitter is an echo chamber. It's just a bunch of Biden fans, but just a bunch of liberals. Uh, most of the significant uh, creators uh, on the site that aren't like milk toast moderates or something have been kicked off <laughs> at this point. Uh, it's devolved into an echo chamber. The problem is echo chambers tend to become more and more extreme over time. You've created a perfect storm situation where virtually every potential extreme ideology, or, pro, or you could say proto-extremism, there are people that have views that are not in and of themselves extreme, but they are moving in that direction in, in a unilinear fashion. You have created dozens and dozens of these little echo chambers by, by just the structure of corporatism is the way it is, um, that are becoming more and more fervent. In fact, when you apply censorship at all, you, you also make more, more of a push for free speech absolutism. You could say that there's an extremist variant of libertarianism. I prefer to think that extreme libertarianism is that you want a gay couple to guard their pot farm with automatic weapons. It's an, it's an age-old joke. But there are people who are like so severely anti-state that they're like, you know, <laughs> they're waiting for an excuse to set off a pipe bomb. There aren't many of these people, but you're going to get more of them if you've created that kind of echo chamber. Because what happens is that they go in and then they petition all of the other people in that group on a forum, a video hosting site, whatever, and they whip them up into a frenzy and then they call you, call other people shills or cucks uh, if they don't fit in. You see this with the left. 
You see this with the commie, for the cringe fringe of the left. They look at someone who's got genuinely left-wing beliefs, what I would class as far left, and they will still say well, that there's something wrong with those beliefs because there's an issue or two on which they diverge from Gen uh, Chairman Mao on. You see this, and it is increasing in scope. Now, what you're being told by the MSM is that because it is increasing in scope, we need more censorship. The reality is that the censorship created the increase. It's not happening because of propaganda from Russia. It's not happening because of Chinese disinfo agents. They get spotted all the time online. Generally, people have a good laugh at them. It's hilarious how incompetent governments tend to be, by the way, at doing this. The U.S. government included in that by the by. No, it's, it's internal. It's very organic. And it's not happening because we have too much free speech. It's happening because we've created an echo chamber style internet through censorship. Ah, it's causing people to become more fervent in their views. They become, they're, they're constantly surrounded by peer pressure on, on these, these online sites, uh, peer pressure from people of similar mind, and they're constantly pushed in a further direction by the more extreme elements therein. They're expected to conform. Now, do they all ideologically conform? No. But the problem is, there's really no big impact, there's no difference in the impact made by a person who says something and doesn't believe it versus a person who does. They're saying the same thing. They're being witnessed by the same group of people. In, in, an echo, in a vacuum, they're going to have the same overall impact. The problem is, even if they're just being facetious, or even if they're just like, yeah, 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 yeah. hail Mao, uh, hail Stalin, you know, they're, fucking, they're trying to get laid from the, the one female communist that's in their group, uh, tends to be a sausage fest, I've noticed. Because a bunch of, a bunch of greasy dudes with micro penises, not exactly a happening thing. Uh, they, get pu they, they, they get pushed in that direction, consistently. And if they say it often enough, even if it starts off facetious, eh, eventually it, it, patter, it uh, uh, imprints upon their behavior as well, upon their beliefs. And so you've got a real big problem here where the extremism is being spawned by censorship. The, the, the same methodology by which some people uh, mistakenly believe they can fight censorship is actually like d dousing the fire with kerosene. It's, a, it's become, I think, the biggest problem uh, of our time. People say, well, COVID, we got a pandemic. No, no, no. Pandemic will kill a lot less people than the kind of thing that can happen when you have exactly the sort of situation you have in cyberspace. And it's being created by corporations and by too much government. We need them to take a hands-off approach. That's why I think 230 should be reformed. We can, we can solve the whole problem with two sentences. Firms in the U.S., if they want 230 protections, they have to not editorialize. That's it. Most of them will stop editorializing. Those that continue to editorialize will lose, will fall by the wayside to those that don't, simply because they'll absorb less audience over time because they're purging everybody. We can solve the problem. We could do it today. Congress could have a vote on it right now, but instead they'd rather kick the can. That's because they like the echo chamber. The echo chamber helps them get votes. That's about all. Peace out.